This morning we continue our series on fear, faith and fear. Let your faith be stronger than your fear. This morning I want us to think for these few minutes about change, about change. How do you feel about change? I don't much care for it for the most part, and I bet that you sometimes feel that way as well. I, I, well, for example, my grocery store and my Home Depot, both of them moved everything around. <laughs> Why would they do that? I mean, I knew where to find everything. Now I can't find anything. Change. It's difficult. We, I have a new version of Microsoft Word and, Microsoft, well, the whole Microsoft Office suite. And I knew how to use the old version and I knew where all the tools were and I knew where all the things that I use frequently are located, what menus they're on, and now they moved everything around. Why would they do such a thing as that? You know what I'm talking about? Those changes, they're small things, really, but they're kind of irritating when people just sort of change things on you. But there are bigger changes than that. Huge changes, as a matter of fact. And we used to be able to say, the only constant is change. The only thing that's constant is change. We can't even say that anymore because the pace of change is so much greater than it used to be. And it's getting faster and faster all the time. From the birth of Christ till about 1750, knowledge doubled. From 1750 to 1900, it doubled again. From 1900 to 1950, it doubled again. From 1950 to 1960, it doubled again. And no wonder Alvin Toffler would write the book in 1970 called Future Shock, where he predicted we would have a hard time dealing with the pace of change. Just last week, IBM released a report that said that all of the data that was produced in the last two years represents 90% of all the data that exists in the world. In two years, 90% of all the data that exists in the world. And they have this new term called exobyte. That's the new term. They, we're measuring things now in exobytes. Do you know what an exobyte is? I don't know what an exobyte is. I looked it up and I still can't tell you because it is a huge, huge number. We, by the way, we produce 2.5 exobytes of data per day. And you can go and impress your friends with that knowledge. We're talking about an amazing rate of change. And Toffler was right, although I don't think Toffler had any idea what that rate would be and how it would increase our anxiety and the stress in our lives. Just to give you an example, here's a little thought experiment we can do very quickly this morning. I want you to imagine that you are a modern day Rip Van Winkle. You remember Rip Van Winkle was the character who prior to the Revolutionary War, he drank some kind of potion, he fell asleep, he slept for 20 years, he wakes up after the Rev American Revolution and everything has changed. It's a very different world. But nothing in his world really changed all that much except kind of his personal, well, the government changed in his personal life. But most things really remained about the same. But imagine if 20 years ago in 1992, you drank some magic potion and fell asleep and you woke up yesterday. When you fell asleep, George Herbert Walker Bush was president and somebody named Bill Clinton and Ross Perot were running against him in that election. And you woke up yesterday and somebody mentioned a President Bush that you had never heard of before. And you learned that it was the son of the president who was president when you took that potion. 20 years is all. You had a cellular telephone in 1992. It was the latest portable model. You could carry it with you wherever you went. It looked like an Army Field telephone, and it was about this long. And you didn't talk on it much because, well, it was 50 cents per minute to talk on the thing. And so you only used it in emergencies or for very brief conversations. You had a new computer. It was state-of-the-art Dell computer. It had eight 
megabytes of RAM. It had a 230 megabyte hard drive. It had a five and a quarter inch floppy disk drive as well and a full color monitor. You had to pay, well, you would have had to pay over $3,000 for it, but that was a little too rich. And so you really didn't own it. You were leasing it for $117 a month. It came with DOS 5.0, but you had bought a copy of the latest version of Windows, Windows 3.1, which was very impressive. You'd never heard of the Internet. You'd never heard of the World Wide Web. They existed, but no one had heard of them. There wasn't even a web browser yet to use on the web. Postage was 29 cents when you took your long nap. And the other day, yesterday, when you woke up, you looked and you saw, well, postage, you, you didn't know how much postage cost. Somebody said it was 45 cents to mail a letter, but you didn't know because instead of the amount of postage, there's this cryptic word on the stamp, forever. <laughs> wow, how things change and how quickly they change. People are looking at these little devices in their hands all the time, you notice. And they're punching buttons on them. and They can watch movies on these little things. They can read books. They can listen to music. Why, well, you listen to music on CDs. And now, hundreds of songs in a little bitty box like that. The other day, you saw someone walking down the street, as you did in 1992, talking to himself. But... This person actually had a little device and he was actually talking to someone else, you realize. Can you believe it? In 20 years, the pace of change creates a lot of anxiety, but it's not those changes that create the most anxiety in our lives. It is the changes that come our way over which we have no control and that cause us great difficulty and pain in our lives. Some changes are great. They're good. We must change. To, to be alive and to grow is to change. In fact, there is one culture that has as a curse, may you remain in one place forever. And it would be a curse to not change at all. But we're talking about those changes in life, those changes in relationships, changes in jobs, changes in economic circumstances, changes in health, those changes that come our way over which we have no control and they can be so painful. And what do we do with those? How do we move through those difficult changes in our lives? How do we navigate all of this change in our society and in our world? How do we move through all of that with confidence and with a sense of peace and well-being? Well, the psalmist addresses this in the 46th Psalm. And I just want to leave us with these two brief words. He says, the Lord is my refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. And what the psalmist learned throughout all the difficulties and changes in the psalmist's life was that God is a refuge, a refuge. Now, we tend to think of the word refuge as meaning a hiding place, but it's not that. Rather, a refuge is a safe place to go to regroup than to go back out to do battle or to face whatever the challenges are. That's a refuge. And when the psalmist uses that word, that's what the psalmist means to say. God is our safe place where we can regroup and we can go back out then to face the challenges that are ahead of us. J.B. Phillips points out that meaning of the word refuge in his book, Your God is Too Small, when he, when he says we, we should not think of God as a hiding place, but rather that place to go and to retool and to re-energize for what lies ahead. And he used this image. He said it's like a person who works hard every day and then goes home to a secure, safe home to rest, to eat, to share stories with others in the home and to be affirmed and to get energy again to go back and face it the next day. That's a refuge. 
God is our refuge. And the psalmist says God is our strength. Now I take that to mean that God gives us what we need in our inner life. God gives us the internal strength that we need to face what we face, including the changes in our lives, whatever they are. You know, I did what this morning, what you probably did as well. You looked in the mirror. And what I would not recommend that any of us do is hold up that picture from 20 years ago next to the image in the mirror. Because what would we see? We would see a lot of change and we would see it all at once. And we would be reminded that there are changes over which we have no control. The Apostle Paul knew that. He, in fact, said that this outer nature is wasting away. But he didn't stop there. He said our inner nature is being renewed day by day by day. I think it's Paul's way of saying God is our strength. God is our strength. Renewing us day by day. Especially when we take the time to get quiet. And to remember in that time of quiet. To be still as the psalmist says. To remember that God is God. And that God is God. And we're not alone. How do we move through change? We remember that God is our refuge and all that that means. And God is our strength, renewing our inner nature day by day. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.